Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Welcome back to another episode of Movie House Memories, the podcast where we look back and review the films that we think are the most important films in cinema history. I'm Patrick, and with me, as always, are three people who spent a large portion of their lives in darkened movie theaters. First, he's a host of the Noirsville and Golden Age of the Silver Screen podcast here on the MHN Podcast Network, my right-hand man and partner in crime, Chris Haley. They call me the fat man by name, fat man by choice. <laughs> okay. Also with us, one of the co-hosts of Male Bonding, the James Bond retrospective podcast uh, here on the MHN Podcast Network, the youngest member of a group, and the man you can actually follow on Twitter, at HeyBucker, Matt Palmer. You know, the ladies used to call me the MacGuffin. Because they always left you wondering, well, what was the real point of all that? Yeah, because I never actually got any of them. They uh, used to call them that. They still do, too. It's my Mitch Hedberg joke. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, he's our resident lumberjack and the man from the Pacific Northwest. He appears regularly on Criterion Critics and the Lunchtime Movie Review Podcast, both here on the MHN Podcast Network. Bobby Taylor. And I am the stuff that dreams are not made of. Well, I think that goes for all four of us, without a doubt. Shane, are you there? Uh, hello. Yes, I just <laughs> tuned in. Okay. Also no, with us... Fresh off the streets of, streets of Sydney and probably coming back from a nice press premiere of some wildly uh, overrated film, uh, our resident Australian film critic, Shane Adam Bassett. <laughs> How did you know that, Patrick? <laughs> and yes, I did. G'day, everyone. Thanks for having me. No problem. Would that be a Sydney Green Street? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. I never thought of it like that. <laughs> All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. And before we get started, we'd like to thank all the returning listeners to the show and welcome all new listeners to Movie House Memories. Thanks for downloading us and giving us a try. We appreciate your time and attention and hope you keep on listening and following us on Facebook at Movie House Memories or on Twitter at MH Memories. On either one of those two social media outlets, you can keep informed about our occasional fit written film reviews, news on upcoming theatrical releases, and information on many upcoming podcasts on the MHN Podcast Network. Additionally, you can also follow us on YouTube now, where we're releasing our podcast day and date with their release on iTunes and Stitcher. Uh, and you can subscribe to our accounts there, give us a like, a dislike, and also comment on the, the podcast reviews there as well. And whether you're a frequent listener or a brand new fan of our little show, we hope you take the time after you're done listening and provide us with a little feedback. You can do this one of two ways. If you download us on a, uh, off of either iTunes or Stitcher, you can go onto one of those two platforms and rate our podcast and leave a little comment about the show. Additionally, you can also visit our website at moviehousememories.com and leave a comment about either our podcast, our opinions, or the film that we are reviewing. Finally, on our website, you can leave your star review rating of the film that we've discussed so that we can get a consensus rating from the MHN Podcast Network community. As always, we'd love to hear positive feedback, but we appreciate anything anyone has to say about any of our little shows. Now, with the horrible business out of the way, let's get on to Matt's next pick for one of the greatest films of all time, 1941's The Maltese Falcon. And Matt, do you have a summary for us? Well, I stole one from Chris, so yes. <laughs> Can you tell me a story? In 1941, Ruth Wonderly arrives at the office of private investigators Sam Spade and Miles Archer. She claims her sister is missing and that she needs help finding her because she's involved with a man named Floyd Thursby. Archer calls dibs on the hottie and helps Ruth track down her sister later that evening. In the dead of night, an early morning phone call suddenly wakes Spade. The local police tell him someone shot and killed Archer. Spade heads over to the murder scene where police detective Tom Paulhouse greets him. 
After a brief chat, Spade leaves to tell Archer's wife the news. As Spade arrives home, Paul House and Lieutenant Dundee also arrive to question Spade about the murder. During their grilling, they let it slip that someone offed Floyd Thursby that evening, too. Dundee not so subtly suggests that Spade killed Archer so he could have Archer's wife all to himself. Spade angrily kicks the officers out of his apartment. Spade heads to Ruth's apartment. She's now calling herself Bridget O'Shaughnessy, and now she claims she was partners with Thursby. She says he was the one who most likely killed Archer. Spade doesn't trust her as far as he can throw her, but agrees to investigate the murders when she offers to pay him $500. Spade returns to his office where the fragrant Joel Cairo waits for him. He offers Spade $5,000 to find a black figure of a bird and then pulls a tiny gun on him so he can search Spade's office for it. Spade knocks out Cairo and then searches his pockets for clues. When Cairo comes to, he still... He still hires Spade and then pulls the gun on him again to search the room, which Spade lets him do. Spade meets with O'Shaughnessy again and tells her about Cairo, whom she wants to talk to. So Spade invites Cairo to his place, and when he arrives, it's clear the two know each other quite well. Cairo loses his patience with O'Shaughnessy and reveals Fat Man is in San Francisco. The police arrive again to talk to Spade further, but he doesn't let the cops in. It's only when Cairo screams for help that the police enter Spade's place. He gets them to take Cairo downtown for questioning. The next morning, Spade goes to Cairo's hotel to talk to him again. In the lobby, he spots Wilmer Cook, a young kid that's been following Spade for the last day. He abruptly gives Wilmer a message for his boss, the fat man. Soon after, a man named Casper Gutman calls Spade, wanting to meet him. Spade meets Gutman, a.k.a. the fat man, in his hotel suite to talk about the blackbird, but Gutman evades Spade's questions. To throw Gutman off, Spade fakes a temper tantrum and storms out of the meeting. Later, Wilmer arrives and requests Spade come with him at gunpoint. Back at the hotel, Spade overpowers him, but meets Gutman anyway, since that was his plan all along. Gutman tells the story of the Maltese Falcon and then offers Spade $25,000 for it and $1 million from the proceeds from the sale. While they negotiate, Spade passes out from a Gutman-spilled drink Wilmer, Cairo, and Gutman leave the scene while Spade sleeps on the floor a bit. Eventually, Spade comes to and he takes the opportunity to search the hotel room. He finds a newspaper with the arrival of the freighter La Paloma circled. When he arrives at the dock, he finds the ship on fire, so he heads back to the office. While talking with his secretary, Effie Perrine, La Paloma's captain Jacoby staggers into Spade's office and dies from gunshot wounds. In his hands sits the wrapped-up Maltese Falcon. O'Shaughnessy calls Spade for help at a specific address and then lets out a shriek before the phone goes dead. Spade heads out to a bus terminal to hide the Falcon and then takes a cab to the address O'Shaughnessy gave him. However, the address leads to an empty lot for sale. The cab takes him home where he finds O'Shaughnessy hiding in a doorway. The two head to his apartment where Gutman, Cairo, and Wilmer wait for him. Gutman gives Spade $10,000 for the Falcon, not the 25000 he promised. Unfazed, Spade tells Gutman if he's going to proceed, he needs to fall guy for the murders of Floyd Thursby and Captain, J Captain Jacoby. He suggests Wilmer be the one, but Gutman box. Spade taunts Wilmer until he loses his temper, and then Spade knocks him out. Gutman and Cairo then reluctantly agree to Sam's plan. As dawn arrives, Spade calls Effie and asks her to bring him the bundle from the bus station. When she arrives, Gutman inspects the statuette, but finds it's a fake. When he and Cairo bicker about the revelation, Wilmer escapes. Gutman chuckles to himself and then invites Cairo to return to Istanbul with him to continue their search for the Maltese Falcon. After they leave, Spade calls the police and tells them to pick up the duo before they skip town. When Spade hangs up, he confronts O'Shaughnessy about, with the truth. She killed his partner, Archer. When she confesses, she begs Spade not to turn her into the police. For some reason, Spade has feelings for her, but he suppresses them for justice. He hands O'Shaughnessy over to the cops for the murder of Miles Archer. As for the Falcon, well, that's the stuff dreams are made of. Yay! All right, films are influenced by the times they're made in, and I, uh, we look back at some of the big news events in Lori Flores' Headlines of the Time, presented by me again. All right. Death. Murder. <laughs> I, I tried not to be so uh, so dead. Rapine. Un unfortunately, uh, October of 1941, the month that the Maltese Falcon was released, 
there was a war going on, so that predominated the news. Uh, on October, we weren't in it yet, though. Uh, not yet, but uh, there was still a lot of death and destruction around the oh, world. Yeah. All right, on October 2nd, uh, Operation Typhoon begins as Germany launches an all-out offensive against Moscow. On October 11th through the 12th, a fire destroys a Firestone Tire and Rubber Company plant in Fall River, Massachusetts, consuming almost 16,000 tons of rubber and causing a setback in the United States war effort. October 13th, Heinrich Himmler instructed the SS and police leader uh, Odilio Globich... Globusnik, I don't know how to pronounce that name, to begin construction on Belzac, the first of the Operation Reinhardt extermination camps. On October 18th, uh, General Hideki Toho becomes the 40th Prime Minister of Japan. A little bit more uh, uplifting, on October 23rd, Walt Disney released its fourth animated film, Dumbo, in the United States. And on October 30th, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President of the United States, approves the U.S. $1 billion in Lend-Lease aid to the Soviet Union. Born in October of 1941, on October 3rd, Chubby Checker, the singer of The Twist, was born. Uh, on October 4th, Anne Rice, the writer of the Vampire Lestat novels, was born. October 8th, Jesse Jackson, politician and civil rights leader, is born. October 13th, uh, singer-songwriter Paul Simon is born. And just for Shane, on October 25th, um, Australian singer and actress Helen Reddy is born. <laughs> My mom was born October 18th. Of 1941? Yep. Oh, there you go. And Bobby's mom was born on October 8th. <laughs> All right, top songs. Uh, probably only one of them I recognize. For Nessie by Artie Shaw and his orchestra. Amapola, Pretty Little Poppy. Uh, by Jimmy Dorsey and his orchestra. <laughs> Daddy by Swing and Sway with Sammy K and the K Choir. Chattanooga Choo Choo by Glenn Miller and his orchestra. And Piano Concerto in B Flat by Freddie Martin and his orchestra. Everybody had their own orchestras back then. Movies released in 1941, and this is throughout the entire year How Green Was My Valley, Sergeant York, They Died with Their Boots On. Babes on Broadway, and this week's reviewed film, The Maltese Falcon with Humphrey Bogart. And that is the big news events in 1941. I hate doing the news, let me tell you that. Well, we usually start by talking about the casting, the film, and the lead, very obviously in this film, is Humphrey Bogart playing Sam Spade. Uh, Matt, this is your film. What did you think of Humphrey Bogart in this movie? You know, I used to not like him. I used to think he was so wooden. But there's something about him. He's got some kind of charm. He he grows on me every time I see more of him. So I really liked him in this movie. It wasn't it wasn't a, the type of performance you would ever see modernly, but there's just a certain charisma there that I that I really enjoy. Well, I I agree with what Matt was just saying because I I got to Humphrey later on in his or bogey I guess later on in his career was where I saw him first and I thought he was he was all right but he was a bit grizzled and then I saw him going backwards and I I didn't see that the the great leading man that I thought I would uh, that, that was the wooden part but then the more I watch his movies the more I really 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 like him uh, he just seems to come across as a guy that just isn't authentic 1940s early 1950s tough guy that uh, I, I just enjoy seeing him on screen when he shows up I just I think that I, I know what I'm gonna get when he when he's on screen and and I usually get it well Humphrey Bogart's uh, a pretty big I'm a pretty big fan of his he's one of my favorite golden age actors I think this is now the fourth maybe fifth film that we have reviewed of Humphreys. And the first one on Movie House Memories was Casablanca. We've since reviewed The Treasure of Sierra Madre. This is the second time we are reviewing The Maltese Falcon. The first was for Noirsville. On Noirsville, we we just uh, reviewed um, um, In In a a Lonely Place. In a Lonely Place. And I've also written a couple reviews for Humphrey Bogart as well. I enjoy pretty much everything he does, and I could probably do my own podcast just on Humphrey. 
Uh, I enjoy everything he does. He's a very interesting guy to me. And um, this is one of his great performances. I will say that uh, Sam Spade and Philip Marlowe are probably, in my eyes, the same character. I don't know how much range he brought to the two characters, but this isn't about his portrayal of uh, Philip Marlowe, which is in a couple of years. But um, excellent film, and um, I-, I enjoy his performances in all of these. Uh, yeah, I'll echo that. He he is one of my favorite actors of that golden years of Hollywood, and I was introduced to him at a very young age. Uh, Casablanca and The Big Sleep would have been the two first movies I saw, and then I expanded with To Have and To Have Not and everything else I could on Humphrey Bogart because he was just different. And I can see why some might think he's wooden, definitely, but I think also, on the other hand, he's different and he's just not that stereotypical perfect teeth perfect look you know and that smile it's a little awkward it just all works and i i think he's a, a wonderful actor and in this you know he really does come of age and um it's a defining defining role for him the, the funny thing about him to me is how he's like he strikes me as so like genuinely old-fashioned macho kind of guy that yeah. i have a hard time watch seeing him want to be an actor you know what i mean he, he seems more likely to be like your angry grandfather than a guy who, <laughs> who dreams of stardom. Yeah, he's, he's lovable, but he's a rogue and he's callous at times. He's always got that cigarette in his mouth. But, yeah, I see where you're coming from. You know, you know that Lori, when we first started this podcast, way back in episode one, said that she didn't like Humphrey Bogart, which always surprised me because she's such a big fan of classic films. And and and, and she, I think she kind of articulated he seemed to play the same role. And there's a lot of similarities to a lot of his roles, but there's certain times when he plays that role, such as this one, where he's just pitch perfect and it's hard to imagine anybody else playing that specific role. I, I can't say that I'm, I've seen a lot of his films other than the ones that you know everyone's seen. You know, Casablanca to have until... Um, sorry, God, I'm blanking on my... African to have and queen? have not. African, to have and have not, thank you. I was saying to have and to hold, but to have and have not, African Queen, um, Treasure of the Sierra Madre, uh, the Maltese Falcon. The, I mean, there's you know a whole, you know, there's a, like a series of them that they're quintessential films and they're the ones I've seen, but when you, like In a Lonely Place, I've never actually seen that film. Um, and, and I really do like Humphrey Bogart a lot. I feel, you know, he's, he, along with like John Wayne, he, you know, he plays very similar, but he does it really well. And I really like them. I I feel very comfortable watching him in a role. All right. What about Mary Astor playing, uh, Bridget O'Shaughnessy in this film? Ugh. (laughs) I honestly, I, I, she was the weakest part of this very good movie. And I, I know that she gets all kinds of rave reviews. I just thought she was as average as they possibly could get. She was not attractive, uh, like she was supposed to be this hot number that made every guy's head turn. I thought she was a terrible actress. She could, she was playing a, a dual role where she, you didn't know if she was telling the truth or not. Uh, you know, that duplicity that I just – it was not authentic. I, the fact that Humphrey Bogart, anybody, was falling for her throughout the movie was – just kind of making my stomach turn and i just even at the very end i thought that her when when her character had her her big reveal at the end was completely uh it wasn't authentic to me i i thought that she just ruined the movie to me uh compared to everybody else was awesome she just was was terrible well, it was partly it, it was poor, her her part was poorly written. I didn't like how they wrote the ending that uh, that that Bobby just referred to. But you know, it, she is just an to me an average actress. I'm sure she got the part because of her relationship with John Houston. But if you um, if you look at some of these other femme fatales of the day that um, just hit it out of the park that that um, Bogey had uh, had co starred with. Uh, she is not one of the strongest uh, women up opposite him, and and so I think they could have cast her better. But I don't, you know, overall she's she's not that bad. I'm with, I'm with Chris. I mean, I didn't I didn't hate her. I thought she was I thought she's pretty, and I thought she played this role well enough. 
Same here. She's not that bad at all. Uh, I'm surprised what Bobby said. Um, Mary Astor has such a legacy of movies previously to this. She'd been a silent star. And I guess she's not the most attractive in a sense, but she's still pretty. I think, And I thought her acting was pretty ex- excellent as well at, at times. Um, not perfect, but, you know, obviously I think Humphrey boosts that in certain scenes because with his monologues and her just her sort of reactions but you know what they could have um swapped around lee patrick who plays mm. the uh effie character Agreed. of the secretary she would have been a good bridget o'shaughnessy uh, i really couldn't get enough of lee patrick so that would have been a, an interesting concept but as for mary astor I, i've always pretty much thought she was you know average to above average yeah, I come with, I'm kind of with Shane there. Is I I think that she's kind of uh, an average actress. I don't I don't think of her as poorly. I do kind of agree with Chris. I think she's poorly written in this film. I don't think she's the, there's much to play with with the character. Uh, I, I I will point out uh, Bobby that she was nominated for an Academy cool. Award the I know. same year <laughs> that this film came out for The Great Lie and won it. And that's a film that had Betty Davis in. So she out uh, shown Betty Davis in that film. So she was Academy Award winner within the same year as this film, which uh, I I find it interesting. It was for that film because the the Academy Award has been wrong a lot before. So you just have to, (laughs) just have to point to force fucking gum. That's all you have to do. (laughs) Oh, it's not that bad. (laughs) No, it's not. It's just not best picture. It's just not best picture. I'm just suggesting that there could have been any other actress. This is a, along the lines of, you know, we've we've talked about Clint Eastwood and his girlfriend being yeah. cast in movies. And this is along the same lines. You've got a director's girlfriend who gets the, the plum role when I 100% agree with Shane. I think if they would have switched the secretary up, it would have been a completely different, better uh, better character, even with the writing the way it was. Just keep the writing identical, have a better actress playing the role, and it would have been better. That's all. What about uh, Sydney Greenstreet playing uh, Casper G- uh, Gutman or Gutman in this film? Well, I like Sydney Greenstreet a lot, and you know, I think that he hadn't been in movies that long, if I remember correctly. I think he was a stage actor or something like that. Does anybody know his history? Yeah, this is his first film role. His first film role and his first of eight with uh, Peter Lorre, and the two of them together is just magic. I, I enjoy the two of their rapport in just about every movie I've ever seen from this to Casablanca to three strangers. I mean, they're just a great team. So if the two of them are together in a film, there's going to be some really good chemistry going on. Yeah. I like him too. Again, he's another one of those kind of unconventional guys. I I got sweaty just watching him be on screen, (laughs) but, um, but I, I really like what he brought to the movie. Well, as Chris alluded to earlier, his name is Sydney, so I've got a soft spot for anyone called Sydney, considering I was born in Sydney. Oh, oh I thought it was because it's a girl's name and you felt bad. For <laughs> <laughs> well, lucky Sydney Greenstreet isn't around for you to tell him that, Patrick. Uh, look, I think he's good, and as also as Chris said, his his um, appearances with Peter Laurie are just magical and brilliant and key largo stands out as one of my favorites with those two but another great one yeah. together yeah so sydney is very good in this a uh, little bit underused and he sits sits down a lot and i think that's probably because of his size he seems to be sitting all the time but well, he like was five him. nine almost 300 pounds <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> i mean and there was a lot of side shots these days you have actors that are large and they'll do trick photography and move the camera around in front or behind that there's full on side views of sydney and this he didn't care and i thought his impending uh bit of a menace menacing character of his was it was pretty good i like him in general but in this movie he was underused but very good yeah i'll agree with the underused part i really liked him. he he didn't show up until too late in the movie and when he showed up it was wonderful to have him on screen i agree with the chemistry between he and peter Lorre. i just i thought the chemistry between uh green street and uh bogey was excellent the way that they that they bantered back and forth i loved how uh sydney would giggle through a lot of his roles and i just you know when you've got a bad guy that's giggling it it's very 
off-putting to I mean, it, it keeps you off balance a little bit is he being serious is he not being serious you know how deadly is this guy and then when he's poisoning bogey you're like okay well he's kind of he's got a, a evil side to him so I, I i very much liked him in this role and i have seen him in other movies and i like him just as much in those um i did kind of struggle with his name of gutman and then the fat man i'm like is that <laughs> is that how he got the nickname? I don't know. I'm sure it's in the writing and it just you know coincidental. But I just thought that was kind of funny that that's that, that happened to be his name too. But no, I thought he was he did a wonderful job. And as as the lead heavy double entendre, it, I think he <laughs> he pulled it off really well. He's not an actor that I'm well known for or I know very well, other than the couple of uh, Humphrey Bogart films that I've seen him in. But he is really good in this film, and I didn't know that this was his first performance until I was doing the research, or first film performance until I was doing the research for it, and how uncomfortable he was, and how self-conscious he was in doing it, because you don't get a sense of that at all. He is not timid in taking on this role, and without a doubt, I think he is equal to uh, Bogart's Sam Spade character as far as... Uh, a strength of uh, will in the film and it, and it re- and they're really effective as being kind of uh, opponents throughout this film that I, I really, li- I, I wish he would, uh, as Bobby said, I wish he would have been in the film more because I would like to have seen more of that character. You should, uh, if you ever have time, watch 1946's Three Strangers. Uh, that's an excellent film with the two of them. All right. Uh, that's, I will put it on my list. All right, Matt, what about your moral universe for this film? Well, I'm not going to be fancy. When have I, you I, ever I really been? like the uh, the pers- well. Number one, I love when when the MacGuffin is used as a uh, as a plot technique, a plot uh, a plot device in movies. There's something satisfying about watching people chase chase this thing they they never quite get, and it's done in some some just some really cool movies, you know, like like Pulp Fiction, like this movie. Just some some really entertaining, really cool movies. So I'm always I'm always pleased. However, I, in this case, the Maltese Falcon, I, you know, I think is it's very valuable, and people become overcome with greed by it. And of course, they never they never get it. So the the whole movie, you have these people being motivated by by this extreme level of greed, but it it's impossible to satisfy them, right? So they they tear themselves apart. They abandon all all morality, and to pursue this thing that that's incapable of satisfying them because it's not real. On the other hand, Sam, he he does definitely gets caught up in it, but he ultimately ends up turning in O'Shaughnessy, which um, to to avenge his partner in a sense. So I th- I think he kind of gets out of the trap, and and finds a a value, a kind of this this loyalty or a sense of justice which I think ultimately is much more satisfying to him than just the, the pursuit of gain. So I think um, that's, that's kind of the key contrast there in the movie is his ultimate turn towards a more of a uh, higher-minded value as opposed to the, the greed of all the other characters. Well, I, I really like what Matt was just saying about Bogey and, and the way that he came to final justice in his mind as to what was the what was the right thing to do versus the money and i think that 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 bogey his character was stronger for do for making that choice uh i i think that the falling in love thing was a little too much the morals i mean bogey's sleeping with every or or coming on to literally every female with a skirt in that movie he had something to do with them or calling them by name he was kind of like that in real life too but though bobby (laughs) <laughs> Quite what about probably. I thought Lauren McCauley was very monogamous with her I, I'm just saying the character I'm not I don't know about him personally but I just uh, his character slept with the his partner's wife he came on and my I'm, I'm assuming he probably slept with his secretary at least once because they had something going on between them the, I mean he never called her by name it was always some some uh, term that he would call her, and then immediately the moment that he meets the, uh, O'Shaughnessy, all of a sudden he's in love with her. I mean, it just literally he would just jump from person to person. So I think that morally, I don't think he. Well, obviously he's a 
private detective and he's not going to have the highest morals to begin with. But I thought that part was a little bit uh, – it cheapened him just a little bit. Moral universes are not one of my strong points, uh, but I have seen this movie a few times. And I, I think that Bogey's character swings from both sides. It sort of indicates he's very close to the detectives and they've worked together on and off the record before. Uh, and one gets, you know, more intense than the other at times when they're all do- talking and gets jealous because he's got more attention. So there's a bit of a three way, three way happening there for attention. And I think, yeah, he comes across as being a womanizer, but you can tell right from the start that um, I don't, he, like his, his, uh, his partner dies. And he didn't seem to be too worried about that. Mm-hmm. At all, but and then for him to fall in love immediately with someone who's just walked into his office and it's all linked to his partner as well, yeah, I could tell straight away that the, the whole romantic side of it was just a facade. But yeah, that's that's probably I agree with what Matt says, and I was hopefully I've elaborated a little bit more of what I thought. Yeah, I don't really have much to add to that, so I'm going to just go uh, turn it over to Chris and get Chris's opinion, and then go into Chris's symbolism. You know, I, I kind of wonder uh, if uh, in all that, if she really did love him or if he ever decided or not. You know, he was always he played his uh, cards pretty close to the chest, even when uh, he was faking his his outrage just to get a rise out of people. So I think he would his he was more um, I don't know if amoral would be the, the term in this one, you know, but he definitely, he played by his own rules. He went his own way. He did his own thing and he wasn't afraid to, to uh, break those rules uh, in his world. Uh, and finally, I think he decided that uh, the girl was full of it and he was going to, uh, I don't know, would, would you call it bros before hoes? He, he chose in the end there for his moral. <laughs> That's what I would call it. You know, I, I don't know if there's anything ever more than a working relationship with uh, with Archer. If uh, if they were really good friends, I don't think you saw enough of the two of them to really know from that point of view. But it was pretty interesting from a moral standpoint uh, that, you know, in the end, he um, he did what uh, the you would expect a guy with a white hat to do. And that is to turn in the bad people. So uh, symbolism for this one, uh, there's plenty of little things, but I think the big one, as Matt has said, the big MacGuffin in this is the Maltese Falcon. What does it symbolize? And, you know, we were we were pretty much told point blank that it was originally a symbol of loyalty and generosity. And over time, with the pursuit of these people, it had become so um, corrupted and 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 it basically led these people to a life of greed. And so it, it was a symbolic uh, you know, journey where they are following what they think is this ideal symbol of loyalty and generosity, which has all of this great wealth associated with it. In the end, it turns out to be fake, worthless, pointless, just as greed is and all the, the destructiveness that comes from greed. It, you know, it's all completely pointless. So I think there's a big parallel between that. I also think that the uh, that Falcon symbolized uh, Sam Spade's quest, uh, his, his desire to get the truth out of people. You know, nobody was going to tell him the truth until he had that um, that Falcon in his hand, and suddenly everybody's going to own up to it just so they can so they can get it. But you know, at, at the end of the day, he never really knew if if that uh, if if Bridget uh, loved him. You know, I don't know how much he cared, just as we just I just mentioned. But, you know, he, that that was the only truth that couldn't be revealed. So maybe um, I don't know what uh, what that would say. Maybe that uh, her love isn't going to be bought or she she loves the idea of the Falcon uh, more than anything else. And I think that the fact that this Falcon turned out to be a fake just just shows that the author is saying that uh, that nobody can really ever truly attain the real truth i mean uh, they're never going to know what the real falcon is if it ever uh, existed they, they they just can never know and you know even with sam having that in his hand he's never really going to know the truth on his end too so those are my symbolic things 
I like what Chris just said. I thought that the part about the the Falcon being the point of greed and uh, and how it will, but the person that possesses it ultimately gets is the only person that actually gets a real reaction from people when uh, the 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 people that are seeking it are going to lie their tail off just for the opportunity to possess it um i i also there's one symbol that i think that stands to sends out to me is the uh spade and archer um sign on their on their doors was as soon as archer is dead i mean the moment that Mo- bogey knows that he's dead is he immediately tells his secretary to scratch off all of archer's name and put his name only on there and to me that symbolized it, uh, bogey's or or Art spades personality is as soon as some as soon as the case is over or as soon as he's done with somebody it's scratch off their name and it's put spade on it and i'm moving forward with as me first so i i would put that up there as a symbolism as well but no i really like what chris said well i agree with what chris said i like like that actually there's some things i didn't really notice uh this is probably about the fifth or sixth time i've seen it however i did sort of take notice this time he has a horse racing picture in his apartment in sam spade's apartment on the wall and um you could almost look at it and i thought maybe sam spade because he's always on his high horse or um he hits the ground running you know like and he just keeps on going to the finish line and in the end he gets the spoils of success so um you can see quite prominently that horse racing picture right in the middle of his wall. All right, Shane, what about the music in the film? You're the music lover. You're the one who loves uh, music scores. Well, not just the only one, but uh, primarily that's one of your focuses. Uh, score composed by Adolf uh, Dusch, Dusch. I don't know how to pronounce it. Deutsch. Deutsch. I would say, maybe. Deutsch. All right. What did you think of the score? Uh, it was interesting because I took a lot of notice of it this time, and what I um, just noticed it kept repeating itself. So it's a traditional uh, spurts of orchestral horns and percussion. There's brass, woodwinds, um, but they kept getting used like in either like a, a slower melody or in the background, but it was almost like the same set of music. And when I did some research after noticing that, uh, apparently the entire structure of the score ran for only, for only about 14 minutes. And there you go. So that that score by Adolf was just rehashed from a 14-minute composure. And um, it's not bad. It's it's nothing uh, significant, that's for sure, when it comes to film noirs. There's, there's bigger soundtracks than this one, but it does the job. And if you listen closely, as maybe people will now, having just what I said, it does repeat itself over and over again. Yeah, it's what I would consider a strong classical noir soundtrack. Lots of um, classical themes, a lot of repeating, a lot of dramatic um, sounds. So it, it it didn't really strike me as anything out of the ordinary for those types of films. This movie had music? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm just, you know, you guys know I, only, I, I normally only hear music if I don't like it, and, and I... I I um I must just have a, some block in my brain that prevents me from really noticing it because it wasn't a big deal to me. Uh, I it doesn't surprise me that it's 14 minutes long and it's just repeated each each uh, each time. But what I did appreciate was that it was a it was used appropriately for each scene. So I mean, even when it, it was just used to punctuate what was happening on screen, which is all that they used to do in that in that time frame and for this specific type of movie. So I, it didn't bother me whatsoever. Uh, it's not something that I'm going to go out and, and purchase. It's not a soundtrack. It's just a, no. it's just a background uh, music for, for the scenes and that's all, but it was perfectly fine. Yeah. I, I caught the repetitive nature that Shane kind of pointed out uh, watching the film. Uh, so I'm not surprised the the repetitive uh, themes and melodies used throughout, but I also agree with Bobby. It never, 
contradicted what was going on on the screen to the point where I would pay attention to it, uh, a la Matt, where suddenly the music seems inappropriate and it would take me out of the film, out of the scene, because the music just is, is contradicting what's going on on the sh- scene so much. So it was composed well enough. I, uh, surprisingly i'm not familiar with the uh, not surprising i'm not familiar with the the composer uh or a- any of his work although i uh, my understanding is he ultimately won the academy award at one point in time so all right let's talk about the ending of the film what did you guys ultimately think of the how the film wrapped up and did you find it uh, essentially satisfying uh starting with bobby uh, I, I like I, I agree with what Matt said with the MacGuffin. I thought that that was actually a good uh, ending for those for the bad guys. I thought that the fact that they were still in search of of the the item at the end was was a good way for them to exit the the movie without actually coming to blows or coming to gunfire or anything along those lines that you normally would with with a film noir. But and granted, this is the first of its kind, so obviously that things change. But no, I, I liked how that it ended with them. Um, I I didn't like the way that Bogey basically was that like that girl, but you know O'Shaughnessy. Again, I I don't care for the actress in the role. So the fact that she was had a, her comeuppance, I think is is exactly what should have happened. I still think that uh, Bogey. I, I think he got what he what he wanted in the end. I don't know that he necessarily got what he deserved in the end because, again, he used everybody against each other to get what he wanted, and so he was the the hero. But at what cost? I don't know. It, you know, like Chris said, he's he's similar to an amoral personality. So the fact that he got off clean while everybody else got dirty, then good for him. I guess that's that's the way I'm supposed to take it. And I guess it's it's appropriate. It's just not spectacular. I did like the fact that they kept going after the bird, though. Well, yeah, I don't think anything was settled with that Maltese falcon. I think that uh, the two of them were going to hunt for that until they were dead. You know, until they could no longer get it. Even if they, even if the police caught them, which we don't know. I mean, you assume because it's a '40s fil- Hollywood ending film, but you don't see them captured. They could, you know, they could be. Uh, really good con artists and slide right past the cops. We don't know. So I don't think anything was really resolved other than this little mini escapade with the Falcon. So those two are going to go on for a long time. You know, (laughs) as far as the love interest, I like the fact that as much of a player as Sam Spade seems, you don't know if she ever really cared for him. I assume not. I assume that she was just playing him for the Falcon as well, but you never know. And so there's a lot of vagueness, uh, it, even though this is very much a Hollywood ending. It, it, it's, there's still quite enough vagueness to be satisfied. Yeah, I, I liked I liked his turn. I liked him. I liked his his embrace of justice. Um, I liked the fact that nobody's greed was, you know, fulfilled. So I, I really liked the ending. Look, the ending didn't really do it for me that much. Uh, it's no third man or double indemnity, but it, it has its moments and it showcases the cold heart of Sam Spade. I, I like that part of it. But, yeah, the, the only surprise was it was made of lead and, you know, he's chipping away at it, this really expensive MacGuffin, and he's chipping away at it with a knife or whatever it was. And uh, it, if it wasn't fake, well, he could have been ruining it. So that kind of had me on edge there. But overall, um, the Hollywood ending, as Chris mentioned, is definitely apparent here. I don't think it had a lot of shock value. Um, everything ca- that came before it was much more intriguing. All right. Well, I, I like the ending. Uh, I'm not as disappointed in it as Shane is. Uh, I I like the MacGuffin aspect of it. Uh, I, the first time I saw it, I was very much wondering where Sam Spade was going to fall on which side of the law he was going to fall on. And I don't think the film gave you any, indica- any indication of, other than it's Humphrey Bogart and he's supposed to be the heroic character. Um, I, uh, much as Matt said earlier in the podcast, uh, use of a good MacGuffin is really can be very effective in a film. And I really like that the fact that they didn't find... Uh, the Maltese Falcon. I thought that was really a good ending. I didn't necessarily like the bad guys just 
leaving and going to go get it. I thought that was a little bit of a cheat uh, that, okay, we're just going to go. And that, that always bothers me about the ending of this film. Um, but, uh, it's, it's not, a, it's not a horrible ending. It's just, it's, it's not ultimately all altogether satisfying because you don't see them get arrested. You don't see them get, uh, taken down. You don't necessarily see their come up and she, it's just all done off screen. So that I thought was a little bit of a, a little bit of a cheat. That's my one complaint about the ending of the film. What cop is going to arrest a man that smells that pretty, Patrick? Well, I understand, and that's why I wear cologne all the time, so that it never happens. But <laughs> All right, Film's Legacy, nominated for three Academy Awards. Uh, lost all three of them, unfortunately. Best Picture, lost to How Green Is My Valley. Best Supporting Actor, uh, Sidney Greenstreet, lost to Donald Crisp from How Green Is My Valley. And Best Writing Screenplay, Lost to Here Comes Mr. Jordan. AFI, uh, 1998, the initial 100 Years, 100 Movies list, it was ranked number 23. When that list was redone in 2007, it dropped to number 31, but still in the top 100. 2001's 100 Years, 100 Thrills list, it was ranked at number 26. 2003's 100 Years, 100 Heroes and Villains, uh, Casper Gutman was a nominated villain, and Bridget O'Shaughnessy was also a nom- nominated villain, but neither one of them made the ultimate list. 2005's 100 Years, 100 Movie Quotes, uh, The Stuff That Dreams Are Made Of was number 14 on the Movie Quotes list, and the another line, You're Good, You're Very Good, was a nominated quote, but didn't actually make the top list. Uh, 2008, AFI's 10 Top 10s. It was ranked number 6 on the Mystery Film Top 10 list. It is currently ranked number 227 on IMDb's t- uh, Top 250 Films list. It was uh, placed in the National Film Registry in the Library of Congress in 1989, which is the inaugural class for the National Film Registry. It's in uh, Roger Ebert's Great Movies list and also on the in the novel 1001 Movies You Must See Before You Die. Rotten Tomatoes has it at 100% critics and 91% audience. So what did you guys think of the legacy and would you put it in your top 100? Shane. I'm quite surprised it didn't win any Oscars. Uh, How Green Was My Valley was probably a huge film at the time, though, I, I guess, and still stands the test of time, that one. But yeah, I I love this film. When I say love, I just love Humphrey Bogart and I love his film noir um, repertoire as well as other movies he's made. And certain aspects about this movie, I I just, as a film critic, I just really, really gush over. Um, there are other parts, including the ending, that I'm not so thrilled about. And the writing is what does it for me and the delivery. It does stand the test of time, no... You know, without in no uncertain terms, is it one of one one of the great American films? But is it in my one hundred? No, it'd be in my top one thousand and one for sure, <laughs> like that book. But yeah, it's not my in my one hundred. There's a couple of other bogey movies that are, but Maltese Falcon is not one of them. And ladies and gentlemen, soon Shane's next novel, the thousand and two movies you must see before you die, shall be released <laughs> uh, in in Australia. So to capitalize, it's the sequel. What about you, Bobby? I, I think that the the legacy is appropriate. I think the Academy Awards, I think they got it right, actually, uh, with this. But as far as the my personal opinion, I, I really like what Shane just said about the screenplay and the delivery. I think that the reason this one is considered – uh, one of the first or the first film noir is because of the repertoire. I, I really enjoyed the fact that that they the how these characters played off one another as a a true good guy and a bad guy, but they had shades of gray. And I just I think this was really uh, well done in that form. I don't like the ending um, for the most part. Uh, I very much disagree with the choice of casting for the female lead but you know as far as uh, the uh, um, how beloved this movie is i can i can completely see why 
it's just as far as my top 100 no it's not anywhere near uh i i do i do like bogey a lot i i, I really liked um the uh green uh sydney uh greenspan but i no as far as top 100 not for me chris that how's my how was my uh what was it uh how green was my valley was that the first one with uh, john ford and marino hera together do we know Oh gosh! I want to say it's got to be, if not the earliest. It's probably pretty close. I can't tell you if that's the, the exact first one, but it's <laughs> it's an earlier one of their uh, their pairing. Well, anyway, I can see them beating out this film. I mean, they're both great movies. Have you seen Have um, you seen How Green Is My Valley? <laughs> a long time ago, yeah. I love um, really. I love uh, Maureen O'Hara. I, I yes. like John Ford. I, I like uh, John Ford. I like Maureen O'Hara, and that's not one of my all-time drama. favorites. It's yeah, it's a really heavy drama. So yeah. I saw it a couple of years ago, uh, updated myself because it'd been a while, and it holds up. I really, really enjoyed it. It's kind so of forgotten I nowadays. I think. Yeah, maybe. Maybe I. I didn't. I haven't seen it since the early '90s. I've only seen it once, and it didn't leave a very overwhelmingly yep. great impression. The Maltese Falcon, I thought, was a better film out of those two. Well, I think for repeat value, Maltese Falcon blows it out of the water, but I could see why it, it would have won over this one back then. Uh, but anyway, I think the legacy is legitimate, and uh, I, I, I agree with it. Um, for me, I have lots of room for noirs in my top 100. I have lots of room for bogey in my top 100, and uh, this one is definitely in it. I will say that this is not my favorite bogey film. Um, I like uh, we've already done the Treasure of Sierra Madre on this on this program, which I like more. Um, but I never get tired of watching him. I never get tired of watching Peter Lorre. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't, we didn't talk, even touch on him, did we? Uh, no, but he uh, had an amazing hair piece in this. <laughs> that curly hair. <laughs> Elijah Cook Jr. Um, is a favorite film noir character actor. Uh, if you blink, you'll see Ward Bond in this without uh, John Ford or John Wayne. Yeah, he was good, um, too. You know, uh, and I would consider this, th this film kind of is, the for many people, the, the beginning of the classical age of film noir. And I'm one of those who, who agrees with it. Any Anything from this era to the mid-50s, is it's just outstanding to me. So, yes, this one is... In my top 100, I will agree with everybody on the weaknesses of it, but it's got high replay value. Right. Has anyone seen the previous Maltese Falcons? Because this was the third version of it. No. I haven't. No. Oh, no. I have not seen that version. Okay. Are they all called that? I believe so. I think yeah, so. I there think was they just there was earlier versions, and this is the one that Warner Brothers um, got the hit with, but they tried twice before. All right. Well... I really like this film. I think it's an outstanding Humphrey Bogart film. It has flaws, and we've addressed many of them over the course of the podcast. Uh, I think it's a great film noir. There's, it has many of the elements I like in the film, but ultimately it's not in my top 100. The flaws take it a little bit out. I, I do th agree with you. It has much more repeatability than uh, How Green Is My Valley, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's one uh, the best Humphrey Bogart film of his career, uh, Casablanca and Treasure of, Sierra, of the Sierra Madre, I think are his two outstanding works, which I've already put in my top 100. So I, uh, I, I don't see room in mine for a third Humphrey Bogart film, but it is an outstanding film. By no, by, I do not want to give the impression that I do not like the film. I like it a lot. And it's unfortunate Lori's not here so she could eat crow for a third time and say how she liked Humphrey Bar Bogart in a third movie because I'm sure she would love this film as well. However, this is Matt's pick, so he has the final word. Well, this is not my favorite Humphrey Bogart movie. I think Casablanca and um, Treasure of the Sierra Madre are both just outstanding movies. But I really like this movie. So I, I, the legacy, I, I haven't seen... The movie that beat it out for Best Picture, um, How Green Is My Valley, I, I don't think I've ever heard of it before this podcast, so maybe I'll have to check it out. So I'm not going to not gonna pass judgment on that. I think otherwise it's got a good legacy, an appropriate legacy, and it's um, it's not terribly high in my top 100, but it's a, it's a solid top 100 movie for me. 
All right, that does it for this week's review of the Maltese Falcon. Thanks again for joining us and listen, listening to our little bi-weekly podcast. If you've had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. As we stated before, you can follow us on Facebook at Movie House Memories or on Twitter at MH Memories. On either Facebook or Twitter, you can keep up on our written film reviews, news and upcoming films and Blu-ray releases, and information on, up, on upcoming podcasts on the MHN Podcast Network. Additionally, if you've enjoyed yourselves and you download us off either iTunes or Stitcher, make sure to rate our podcast on either one of those two platforms. And if you have a chance, write a short review of the, the podcast. As we stated before, you can also follow us on YouTube where you can subscribe to our account and get updates about our recent re- our recent re- recently released podcast, if I could speak tonight, uh, as well as leave comments or uh, likes or dislikes as to a podcast on there. Of course, we always like the reviews and feedback that are positive, but we appreciate any uh, information or any feedback that we can get from any listeners of the show. Well, that does it for this episode of Movie House Memories. Uh, join us next time when it is actually before we go. Uh, I almost forgot. Before we go, this unfortunately is going to be Chris's last episode on Movie House Memories. And at this is the point in the podcast. Boo. What? The kids, the oh, kids horse cheery. feathers. Don't be a sap. <laughs> horse feathers. Well, it's because we're not reviewing horse feathers that he doesn't want to be on the show anymore. But, <laughs> no. Yeah. I'm like, that's BS. <laughs> Uh, you you start Movie House Memories with the Bogey movie. You end it with the Bogey movie. <laughs> I don't see how you can fail. All right, Chris is stepping away so he can focus on his other uh, podcasts, uh, Noirsville, uh, Sun or no, Sunday you, Seconds with the Duke. We uh, that's coming back. All right, Sunday Seconds with the Duke, uh, Golden Age of the Silver Screen. You have the sci fi one, correct? And vintage sci-fi films coming next year. All right. So he's on four podcasts. He, he, yeah, I'm sure he'll appear on Lunchtime Movie Review from time to time. To time and he always seems to be on the number two review as well. So he's around, but he's going to take a break from uh, Movie House Memories until we need possibly someone to fill in. Or there's a movie he really wants to review. But uh, he won't be appearing regularly. Shane and Bobby filled in for him last year when he took a, a a sabbatical for a little bit and they've been appearing reg- regularly so they're going to be regular uh, uh reviewers going forward and eventually Lori will get back from her little break and there'll be five of us on the show so uh just stick around because next episode is going to be one of shane's picks again and he's picking 1997's wag the dog with robert de niro and dustin hoffman a very unusual pick and if i um remember correctly bobby's going to replace my symbolism section for carrot top style props yes that's that's what he wanted to do so <laughs> I, I don't think it's going to work in an audio show but you know he says he can make it happen so hey bobby's talented i got faith <laughs> this i gotta hear for so a second I. there for a second there i thought you said carrot top was replacing bobby <laughs> <So>. <laughs> nah, we like bobby better He'd yeah, be funnier. Yeah. yeah no i don't think so i he, don't think so <laughs> you know less unless I, he does something that he's never done in one of his acts i don't think he could be <laughs> all right all right until next time i'm patrick i'm chris Hi. i'm matt i'm bobby and i'm shane and we'll see you all next time at our house is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The theme music for Movie House Memories, Hiding Your Reality, is provided courtesy of Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. All original content for this podcast is the intellectual property of the MHM Podcast Network, Movie House Memories, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted. <laughs>